are just joining, welcome to today's presentation on Managing Chef Cookbooks with JFrog Artifactory. Let's go ahead and get started. Jillian, why don't you kick us off by telling our audience a bit about our partnership with JFrog. Great. Thanks very much, Jamie. Uh, as Jamie mentioned, I'm a product manager here at Chef, uh, so good morning to everyone, or good afternoon or evening, as the case may be. Um, and we've been working closely with JFrog on a number of different initiatives for a, a number of months. Um, and you know, many of our customers use, tell us that they use Artifactory for storing many of their other artifacts that they have within the enterprise, such as you know, Ruby Gems, War Files, or any other kinds of uh, artifacts that they might be using in their uh, regular production infrastructure. And one of the things that we are excited to announce is this um, joint feature that has made it into the uh, latest version of JFrog Artifactory, which is now you can store your chef cookbooks in Artifactory as well. And so I'd like to turn it over to Baruch, who will uh, talk to you about that initiative and uh, how you can go about doing that. Um, thank you, Julian. Hello, everybody. Yeah, so my name is Baruch. I'm developer advocate with JFrog. As you can see, we have matching hats here with Julian that was an effort towards this webinar, part of our partnership. I think it's in agreement that we both have to wear our heads now. Um, and uh, I'm very excited to be here and talk about um, chef integration with Artifactory because this is something we've been uh, waiting for um, a long time to happen. And um, we, we get this requirement from uh, or demand from a lot of our users and customers um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about Artifactory and, and why it is important uh, to support as uh, many technologies as possible, including uh, um, infrastructure as code tools like, uh, like Chef. So um, let's talk about that. Um, um, that's the agenda for today. Uh, we're going to uh, review um, do a brief uh, review of what Artifactory is. Um, and uh, we're going to talk about uh, how repositories are used when we are talking about Chef and Artifactory, why uh, um, it's a good idea to have an in-house uh, supermarket, an in-house repository, uh, why it's a good idea to have it um, with other solutions. We'll do, um, we'll do a demo, and um, then we will have plenty of time for, for Q&A. That's, that's the plan. So um, let's start with something that all of you should be familiar with for a very, a very long time now, and that's um, continuous integration, continuous delivery pipelines. What you see here is um, um, a great illustration from one of my favorite books on the subject, which is called Agile ILM uh, by uh, Michael Hutterman. It's a, it's a relatively old book, and uh, that's kind of what I like about it, because those concepts are very mature, and we actually do them for years. You can see here how a pipeline implemented in, uh, for um, um, software delivery, and you can see um, that there are different environments um, from which one after one the, your um, artifact, uh, your binary artifact is being promoted through um, what is called the quality gates. And, and, and again, as I mentioned, I really don't uh, think that um, those are, are news for everybody, and that's, that's a good thing about it. And um, just to show you another view of, of, the, same, of the same process, um, I will go through an experience um, of um, a, a product build uh, going all the way through the from the development team all the way to to production through different environments. So it all starts with the developers writing some code, and uh, they use um, different kinds of build tools and technologies for that. And uh, you can think about developers that write code in Java and use uh, tools like Maven and Gradle and Ivy or in .NET, working with uh, a, a NuGet, Ruby, a Python, NPM, uh, whatever, whatever you think about. And they configure their software using those dependency management and package management and configuration tools. But also, um, in today's world, the hardware is a software as well. And uh, with all the infrastructure as a code movement, which of course Chef is the leader uh, in this market, we configure our infrastructure and our hardware in code itself. 
So the development team, which is actually now DevOps team, can also write code which is an infrastructure code and then use um, tools like Chef or maybe Docker to configure their environment. After this is done, they of course will run a local build on their machine to verify that everything works and this uh, build will require dependencies and artifacts from remote repositories. So if you think about, um, um, again, application side of the house, uh, think about uh, maybe Java Maven build that requires a new dependencies as jar files from a repository or an NPM packages that are required to run a certain JavaScript code. And if we are talking about infrastructure as code, um, then of course, um, in our example for Chef, it will be a cookbooks or dependencies for cookbooks that are required from, a, from the repository. And all those will be uh, retrieved from a local repository. Uh, think about maybe local registry, local supermarket in, sure, in Chef terms. Um, and if they won't be found, then uh, your um, repository manager, such as Artifactory, will try uh, to fetch them from remote repositories. And those remote repositories are, of course, um, something like a Maven Central or J Center for Java, NPM Registry for NPM, or, of course, Chef a Marketplace for a Chef Cookbooks. And it will um, cache it inside your artifact repository, inside Artifactory. And then, of course, the build or the dependency resolution will be successful. Once that's done, next step is, of course, um, committing all the source code, the new configuration files, new dependencies into source control, after which the CI server usually kicks in. And it can be any type of CI server, Jenkins, of course, um, TeamCity, Bamboo, or one of the cloud ones, Circle CI, Drone Eye, or Shippable, Circles, whatever, whatever you work with. And this CI server does exactly what the developer just did on their local machine. So they use the exactly same uh, dependency managers, exactly the same package managers and build tools to configure and uh, the same environment and uh, um, actually rerun uh, the same build on the CI server now. The difference is that the CI server actually also produces something. It can produce your, um, the outcomes of your build, which are um, your, um, uh, your software. Uh, so again, if we are looking at the application side of the house, it will be maybe a WAR file if you build with Java that actually runs inside Tomcat on some uh, production server, or um, just an archive with a bunch of artifacts that should be downloaded by a client and run on their machine. Whatever type of um, artifact is being built, it is then created by the CI server and deployed back to the um, uh, back to the repository uh, manager, back to Artifactory in our example. Um, along with um, this file that is our application, a, a lot of information is, is um, deployed as well. This is what we call the build info, a bill of material, and that's all the information that we gather through the build itself, like environment variables in your CI server, the dependencies that were used, and tons of uh, additional information that is downloaded. The next step will be starting to pass this build through those security gates that we spoke about earlier. So, um, uh, sorry, quality gates. So, uh, different quality tools, um, like um, it might be um, Selenium for the UI tests, or Cucumber for um, behavioral tests, um, JMeet or Gatling uh, for stress tests, uh, or a manual QA, and um, all those contribute additional metadata about the quality of those artifacts. And as those artifacts being, um, um, as those artifacts uh, being um, advanced through those um, quality gates that we spoke about, they uh, get installed in different environments and provisions on different environments until they are closer and closer 
to, uh, uh, to production. And next step will be actually deploying those artifacts onto different environments. And here again, the provisioning tools, like Chef, of course, work with the artifacts that we produced previously in Artifactory and deployed those artifacts to different environments. To do that, they need to provision those environments again, and this actually is kind of a meta process that also will use the same artifact, uh, the same artifacts in this artifact repository, like the chef cookbooks, in order to do that. And in case we have um, um, not a deployable software, not the software that we put around on our own servers, but distributable software, um, software that uh, our customers or, or uh, the end uh, endpoints, whatever they are, people, machines, IoT devices, need to consume and download, then we will use a distribution platform, something like JFrog uh, Bintray, to distribute the software from it. But that's not our case of today. Today we are talking about deployable software, software that is deployed to our servers. So that's the big picture, and, and again, I really hope that I didn't um, tell anything new to you in, in, in the last five minutes, because this is something that we do for years, and it's been successfully implemented in, in any software development company. And the interesting part here is how um, Chef uh, cookbooks and Chef recipes, which are not exactly the production artifacts, fit into this picture with all the production artifacts like JAR files and NPM files or um, uh, NuGet packages, etc., etc. And why it is important for them to be on the same platform in the same artifact repository. And the answer um, uh, would be the metadata. Um, when you work with multiple technologies that work together to create one product, it is extremely important that the metadata about all those artifacts will be shared um, across those different aspects of your application. And, and taking again this example of um, a WAR file which need to run in a certain Tomcat uh, server container, you can think about various requirements that need to come into play in order to this application to be provisioned correctly. It might be the exact version of Tomcat, for example, that need to be a set up on the production servers. Where do you express which version of your application works with which version of the cookbook or the recipe that sets up this Tomcat to work with correct database and maybe with correct schema on the database, etc., etc. This uh, linkage between your application and your code that sets up your infrastructure have to be somewhere. And of course, there are a lot of ways to implement it. You can do it um, using um, maybe file names that you can specify some kind of metadata in the file name itself. That is not very um, convenient, and actually you will uh, run into the obvious uh, limitations on how long the file name, reasonable file name can be, but it can be done. You can maybe package inside the archive some kind of metadata files that then uh, can be extracted and observed, but of course it's much easier when your artifact repository provides you with this linkage between different package types. When you can, when you can specify metadata that relates a certain cookbook um, of how to install the application to the application file itself. And uh, when you have a cookbook that needs to take a file from Artifactory, wouldn't be lovely if this cookbook can um, rely on this metadata to get those files. And then we have a query language that allows you to uh, um, to query those artifacts and get the list of the artifacts that specify, um, that, that answer this specification exactly. And then you can uh, bake those query language, uh, those queries in this query language uh, into your 
um, recipes and your cookbooks and rely on the fact that your recipes will download the right artifacts from Artifactory based on this shared metadata between the artifacts and, uh, and the recipes. So I, have, uh, I hope that makes sense. And um, if you have any additional questions about um, this metadata and the importance of uh, having this universal solution, please go ahead and use the Q&A panel now to ask them. We will get to all the questions that you have. And I already see some wonderful questions here um, towards the end of the webinar. So um, now let's talk a little bit about um, Chef uh, Supermarket. And um, that's, of course, the central repository for uh, cookbooks that, that we use. And um, it's wonderful to have it out there because there is a lot of open source wisdom already being uh, baked into uh, those cookbooks. And you can find um, whatever um, cookbooks that was, were previously written. So, for example, if you search for Artifactory in uh, Chef Supermarket, you will be able to find um, a decent number of different cookbooks that you can install Artifactory with. That's just my um, experience, what I try to find. And, of course, there are many, uh, many, many others. Um, but um, wouldn't be lovely to have your own um, version of supermarket running on your machine. Uh, and th there is a lot of uh, good reasons to do that. Um, stability, you know, the internet nowadays is much more stable than it used to be 10 years ago, but still um, it's, it makes sense uh, to have your cookbooks uh, set up on your um, internal network and not relying on the internet connection going to the um, chef supermarket and I don't imply here any anything regarding the stability of the supermarket service by itself but it's always good to have um, a backup and have some uh, all the cookbooks cached. Um, control uh, you want uh, to veto, to review, to whitelist, to blacklist the cookbooks that your organization can, can use, for example, and that's very easy to implement when you have your own cache of the cookbooks from a, the global supermarket. You can uh, review them and decide whether you want to allow some of them used inside your organization or not. And the third scenario is, of course, publishing your own cookbooks. If there is um, if there are cookbooks which are private to your organization, you might prefer not to share them with the world and not to uh, publish them into the global chef supermarket, but instead having your own uh, supermarket in house and use that. Mm. So there, there there are different solutions on how can you run. Uh, your own private supermarket, and uh, here is an entry um, uh, in the Chef blog uh, by Neil on how to do it. Um, it's rather lengthy, you know what, let me show it to you uh, live. Um, here it is, just let me turn on the the share right here okay now we can see it and uh, it's it's rather straightforward but it's kind of not a very um, intuitive process there is a lot of stuff that you need to do. You need to run your own chef server in your organization. And then you need some to set up a bunch of different cookbooks that will do the job, right? And it's kind of a tedious process with a lot of places to make mistakes and, and, and a lot of um, single points of failure here. Um, eventually, of course, uh, I'm sure that it's more than a possible to use, but it's kind of a hard thing to do. 
So here you go. Um, as I mentioned, not a rocket science, but also not exactly the most the most you know simple thing to do and not exactly a one click process so instead um you can use artifactory to implement multiple chef supermarkets uh, out of the box so artifactory is a, a much easier to install um, there are as i uh, mentioned a couple of um, actually chef uh, supermarket cookbooks that allow you to install Artifactory, or um, you can use any of uh, uh, half a dozen uh, different ways to install it um, as a Linux server, as a, um, a brew um, with Homebrew and Mac, a Docker image, or you can even have um, a service running on our servers and then you just consume it uh, without e even installing anything. Um, and once you did that, once you have Artifactory up and running, it's very easy to set up uh, different supermarkets inside Artifactory. Um, a remote repository, what we have a repository, is a kind of analogous to the supermarket in chef terms. So a remote repository proxies uh, remote supermarkets like uh, the default supermarket.chef.io and the local repository you will use to store private cookbooks and we are going to do both of them um, in just in a couple of minutes as a part of our demo. Um, uh, Knife is a very uh, nice to work with client for, for a working with supermarket although there are um, the, the, there are a couple of limitations. And first of them is that Knife can be configured to work with a single URL when it performs the operations. You can specify the URL for each and every command, which uh, then you can, of course, use different URLs for different commands, but um, it's kind of tedious. There is a way to hard code the URL that your Knife is configured to work with, but then you need to select one. And uh, if you um, set up multiple supermarkets or multiple repositories in Artifactory, the question is, how can you switch? How can you retrieve um, cookbooks from the um, chef supermarket cache from one side and deploy your own cookbooks into your local repository? And the answer is, um, Artifactory comes with the notion of virtual repository, which allows you to... Um, aggregate multiple repositories underneath. So we're going to get a single URL to a supermarket that actually have a multiple repositories beneath it. Um, Artifactory will take care of merging all the metadata together. So um, from the a client perspective, from a nice perspective, it will be just one supermarket with all the content that we need. And it's also backed by a local repository, which means that when we publish a cookbook into this virtual repository, it will get into the right local repository of our choice. So this is how we overcome this limitation of having a single URL in, in Knife configuration. And there is another um, a limitation which can be very uh, easily overcome as well, is that Knife doesn't work with, um, out of the box, doesn't work with a username and password authentication method. So um, instead, we will uh, use um, our own set of commands, um, um, which uh, are implemented by installing Knife Artifactory plugin. It's just a single liner that installs this plugin, and then it allows a bunch of um, our own custom plugin uh, commands. One of them is that now we can um, use the username and password authentication, and, and the other benefit is that we have simplified commands to work with Artifactory, stuff like um, install cookbooks and publish cookbooks. Um, all that is simplified um, to work with Artifactory by using our plugins. So um, with that, 
let's get to a demo so I'm going to share my screen here again okay so it's looking good I hope you see my screen and um, so first of all this is uh, um, the Artifactory user guide um, go to just you know, just Google Artifactor user guide, you will get to this one. And uh, there is a page dedicated to working with a uh, Chef Cook, uh, Cookbook repositories. It has all the all the steps that we're going to uh, do today, and of course much more. Um, also additional defaults, uh, additional details. Nothing uh, too complicated, but step by step instruction on how to work with it. And uh, we're going to do uh, the scenario that we spoke about. Uh, we're going first to proxy chef supermarket inside our artifactory. So this is my artifactory instance. As you can see, I run an artifactory instance in a cloud, um, jfrog.io, and it works exactly the same for on-prem locally installed artifactory instance as well. So uh, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to create a remote repository for a chef supermarket. That's, that's the first thing that we are going to do. So creating a new repository is very easy. I select chef here as a package type, and I will call it chef supermarket. And as you can see, the URL that this repository will cache uh, automatically set to the uh, right URL of supermarket.chef.io. I can test it to verify that everything is good. And actually, our work here is uh, is done. Um, now we have Artifactory that knows how to cache a um, chef supermarket. And the uh, um, next thing that we need to do is to set up Knife to work with that instead of working with the central supermarket. So we can go to our newly created repository and click on the Set Me Up button and get all the instructions of how to do it. And there is actually one line that we need to do is to add this knife supermarket site instruction into our um, into our knife.rb file. So we will copy that and now we will uh, we will just edit our knife rb file here we go it's an empty file so we will add this line we'll save it and our work here is done so now we can try and run the knife commands. So um, what we're going to do is we're going to install the official chef client cookbook. Okay, we see the commands are running. The cookbook was downloaded. Some dependencies were downloaded as well. And looks like we are all set. Let's take a look in Artifactory to see what actually happened. We're going to refresh our Chef Supermarket cache. And as expected, the Chef client and all the dependencies are successfully installed. We have the Chef Info tab here that we can see more details about our cookbook. You can see here information like the name, the version, maintainer, source URL, and all the rest. We also see the list of dependencies, and all those dependencies, as you can see, were successfully installed as well. So here is our Chrome dependency, 
and log rotate and windows all of them are right here the list of the platforms all the metadata about the chef info is is right here uh, the properties is exactly uh, the metadata that I spoke about and you can see here that by default we fetch a lot of information about this cookbook from the um, uh, metadata and expose them as artifactory properties right here and those properties can be used in this query language that we spoke about as, and um, uh, together with your custom properties or with uh, um, implicit file properties like size, number of downloads, etc., etc., to construct any kind of query that uses all this metadata to provide you with exactly what you are looking for. So this is this is remote and it's all it's all nice. But now let's create a local repository here and try to publish our own packages into it. So we will go and create a local repository here. Again, it will be Chef. We will call it Chef Local. And actually, that's the only thing that we need to do. Our Chef Local is created. But the problem is now that we have to select what URL we want to expose in our NIA configuration. Will it go to the supermarket, uh, to the Chef supermarket, or will it go to Chef Local? But as I already mentioned, we have this nice feature that can solve this problem, and that's a virtual repository. So getting back to the configuration, we'll create a new virtual repository, Chef as well, we will just call it Chef, and we will include both Chef Local and Chef Supermarket in it, and we will make sure that when we publish a cookbook, when we deploy a package, it will go into the Chef Local local repository. Now, we have a single URL that combines both of the uh, cookbooks. So getting back to our browser, we can now go to the Chef artifact a repository, click on the Set Me Up, and get the URL that actually takes care of both of them. So again, let's copy it and um, change the configuration of Knife right here to be Chef. Now it's all good, and we can try and publish our own um, our own page. So for that, now we can um, use the new artifactory commands that made available for us after we installed uh, our artifactory plugin to Knife. So. Uh, let me show you the commands that are available for us. And here they are. Those will be the additions that Artifactory plugin adds to Knife. And you can see here stuff like Knife Artifactory download, Knife Artifactory install, and then just the name of the cookbook. And there is a search here, and we will use Knife Artifactory share to share our own new cookbook. First, let's create it. Um, so I'll go into my cookbooks and here I will create um, a new a cookbook that is called My App. Okay, this is just the vanilla empty app, but it's good for our um, example. And we are going to publish this My App to our virtual repository, which in turn will uh, will make um, will deploy this uh, cookbook into a local repository. So we will use the um, artifactory command here, um, knife artifactory share my app. We are going to try to share it, and it fails. It fails with the forbidden command because, of course, while with the forbidden error, because of course while the read is allowed to everybody because 
it's our organizational supermarket, and we want to allow the developers to use these cookbooks um, without a need for username and password, the deployment is, of course, protected, and we got the forbidden error. So in order to overcome it, we need to incorporate user and password into um, our a knife configuration. And this is done again from the Set Me Up button. So now we are going to type our password right here. And instead of just using um, the URL that goes into this virtual repository, we are going to use a URL that has my um, name and the generated API key that was generated based on my password. So again, I can just copy um, this line into a, um, a clipboard and paste it instead the simple URL. Now, oh, that wasn't exactly what I need. What I need is that. So now I have my supermarket site um, authenticated with my username and an API key that actually a, a representation of my password. I'll sell, I save that and just retry the command. And now the upload is complete. It looks like it ended up without errors. And we can go to Artifactory and look what happened now. So this is our virtual repository and here is our Chef Local. Let's refresh it. And as you can see here, my app was successfully deployed and of course, now it can be used from the same URL that um, we used the supermarket cache. So getting back to the virtual here, we can see that it has, it includes both repositories here, the local and the supermarket and um, going here to, uh, sorry about that here and going here to this URL will actually show us the view of everything we have both in my local supermarket and in the cache of my remote supermarket, the general chef supermarket. So you can see here that both chef client that we installed from the cache and my app that we just deployed from my machine are here, and this, this is the entry point for both, uh, both repositories inside the virtual repository. So I think uh, that concludes the demo. And uh, now uh, we have plenty of time, about 20 minutes, for, uh, for your questions. Great, thanks so much for the uh, for the demo and the presentation, Baruch. And uh, uh, it's Julian done again. I'm going to go through some of the Q and A, some of the questions that we got here. Um, the most popular one, we got a few questions around how to manage dependencies between cookbooks. Um, just read one. Dependencies can be built, for example, within the system itself. How does this solution help in this case? So that's um, exactly, um, that works exactly the same way as any other dependency which is published um, into supermarket. And uh, the solution, of course, will be publishing the dependencies as well. And um, as I showed in an example of the official chef client that comes with a bunch of dependencies that all come from the central supermarket, it works exactly the same for your own dependencies um, uh, that you publish to your own supermarket, to this local repository. And in a lot of cases, you will have mixed a uh, set of dependencies. Some of them are your local and some of them uh, that uh, will actually come from um, another developers and other contributors and are part of the chef supermarket. And by using virtual repository, it will be uh, able to resolve both of them. So there is um, no problem at all in using mix of the, rep of the dependencies, your own and external, as long as they are all in some, published in some repository in Artifactory. And, and then everything will just work as, as expected. So my app was a very simple and didn't have any dependencies, but it definitely could depend on other cookbooks that, and then it would just great, uh, just work in the same way. Great. Um, let's move to another question, um, which is, 
to use Chef with Artifactory, do we need to have a Chef server, or can we use Solo or Zero? So Artifactory by itself is is a Chef server, right? So once um, w one of the big advantages in that is that you don't need to set up additional a uh, Chef server in your organization in order to chef to serve the cookbooks from it. When you use a knife with Artifactory, uh, you get your cookbooks downloaded locally, and then you just work with them as it works Chef Solo. Great. Um, let's go to another one. If I have a, um, looks like this a customer has a virtual chef repo that contains both a local chef repo and a remote. They're using Bookshelf to manage the cookbooks uh, right now. When they try to manage, when they try to vendor cookbooks, we see a timeout on the indexing of the cookbooks um, on the request of the universe. Any advice there? So there is there is some uh, there is some um, quiet period between the calculation of the metadata and that's just because we wait until the deployment of different of multiple different cookbooks uh, are completed before uh, calculating and merging metadata. Um, the, if there is a, a timeout which is uh, not reasonable in terms of uh, how long um, we should wait until time um, the, the, the metadata is calculated, there is a property in the advanced configuration of the virtual repository that controls how frequently the metadata is checked and calculated. That can um, definitely be a solution. Um, if that doesn't work, I guess it's worth uh, writing uh, um, a note to our support and uh, we will look into it. Maybe there is some other misconfiguration that, that is done. Great. Thanks. Um, let's see. Is it possible to have multiple local repositories and one virtual repository? Oh yes, absolutely. Uh, it's actually a very good idea to have multiple uh, local repositories because if you remember this diagram that I showed in the beginning um, of the promotion pipeline with all those quality gates, that stands for um, chef cookbooks as well, of course. You definitely want to have different local repositories with different visibility. It can be based on the um, quality of those cookbooks. There is some in development quality and some in uh, staging quality and in production quality. It definitely should go into different um, um, local uh, repositories, but also um, a lot, uh, we see a lot of uh, other use cases in which different uh, local repositories uh, make a lot of sense, stuff like per project. Uh, every project want to have their own set of um, local repositories, um, et cetera, et cetera. So it's definitely a very valid use case to have multiple local repositories. When you um, aggregate them under a single virtual repository, of course, the resolution will be unified. But when we are talking about deployment, one of those local repositories need to be selected as the default um, local repository to which the artifacts will be deployed when they are sent into this uh, virtual repository. Um, for the obvious reasons, you can have only one target repository for your artifacts to go to. I hope that that makes sense. It doesn't, it doesn't mean that you cannot deploy into local repository directly. Of course you can, but um, if you want to deploy through virtual repository, you need to select one local repository that this virtual repository is back to in terms of deployment. Resolution will work with as many local repositories as needed under a single virtual. Great. Um, how do you respond to the problem that the Artifactory plugin for a knife uh, doesn't currently prevent the overwriting of existing uploads? That's um, actually a, a, a not a problem because it is taken care of um, in the level of Artifactory permissions. So Artifactory have a very um, rich permission model, which is <coughs> sorry, which is um, um, targeted 
towards a binary files management. And one of the rules in binary file management is that you can never or you shouldn't uh, override binary files because they're versioned not by their content, but by, by, by their name. And if you um, deploy the file under a certain name, it shouldn't be deleted. If you have a new version, it will have a different file name and it will reside uh, by it. So override permission in Artifactory is a very, I would say, uh, you know, kind of administrative permission that shouldn't be granted a lot. It has its separate entry and uh, all you need to do in order to prevent overriding of the packages through Knife or any other uh, uh, client is to specify the right permissions on the repository. And most of the times you, w you won't allow um, override of the files on the permission, uh, sorry, on the, on the repository level and trying to override the files using knife commands will end up with a um, server-side error, which basically means you don't have permission to override. Great. Um, let's see, wow, we have a lot of questions, this is great. Uh, let's see, uh, does this new plugin work also with Brookshelf? And I can answer, yes, it does. Uh, yeah, so so the the plugin itself works with, uh, um, I would say the the official um, guidelines are are with Knife. Uh, we are looking into expanding to different clients as well. But me personally, I I am not sure we can guarantee that it works with Berkshelf in the same way. Gotcha. Okay, is there any need to specify a different supermarket URL in the Brooks file? Uh, well, so again, you don't need to just because a virtual repositories allow you to use the single URL to approach all the supermarkets inside the repository, right? And 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 both for read and um, and deploy. So here we are in a better way. I have a question for you, uh, Julian, because I'm not very familiar with Berkshelf. Does it allow multiple uh, marketplace URLs in the configuration? Uh, I'm not sure about that. I think you can specify multiple sources. I think one of the things that um, you know we have been talking about in the community is actually being able to add Artifactory perhaps as a first class uh, citizen within the Brooks file, right? So right now, instead of saying, right now the way you need to do it is you need to say, you know, the supermarket URL is, is basically pointing to Artifactory and maybe in the future we can just say that that says Artifactory and that you could also use the public supermarket at the same time. So you have a completely different source instead of just mixing and matching the sources as we do now. Oh, okay, okay. So if, if it does support multiple sources, and here I can see that um, our listeners actually confirmed that, then of course you can specify multiple artifactory URLs directly in Berkshire and, and let's say here is my um, a local repository for a one, one project and here is another local repository for another project and th those will be the sources that I deploy to and for resolution here is a one entry point which is a virtual repository that aggregates all of that. That's actually the, the, the best practices that are used in Artifactor with other uh, package managers being it both con uh, other configuration tools or development tools or, or what's not and uh, um, Artifactory have this flexibility of supporting both a single URL as a knife and multiple URLs as in Berkshelf. Both work, you just um, select whatever uh, practice uh, fits more. Uh, I would generally advocate to have as um, less URLs as possible just because um, it simplifies the configuration but it's definitely up to the maintainers to decide how many and which URLs make sense for them. Right. Uh, another question from Anwar. Um, can you use service accounts instead of your username and password? Yes, absolutely. So Artifactory supports um, a, a wide range of um, organizational uh, uh, tools for um, access control, LDAP, Active Directory, um, OAuth, and, and what's not. 
and uh, you will just get uh, your um, username and the API key um, from uh, directly from your organization tools instead of using Artifactory um, user server and it will actually do the exact same way. Great. Um, and there is, the, there is the, oh, I, I see, Julian, I see a lot of questions about, about something that I said, and I think I want to clarify that a little bit, and that when I said that you don't need to run another chef server with a, alongside Artifactory. Well, I actually meant is that you don't need to run a chef server for provisioning the cookbooks. Now, of course, chef server does much more. Uh, like managing uh, nodes, managing uh, agents, chef environments, etc., etc., all that is not covered inside Artifactory. So it's definitely um, for everything else except of provisioning chef cookbooks, you will need a fully pledged chef server installed somewhere in your environment, just to make it clear. Yeah, I think that's a helpful point of clarification, through because I think some folks thought that it could manage nodes and things like that as well. Yeah, so no, no, it's it's just a yeah. server of serving the, the cookbooks, yes. Yeah, right. Um, let's see, yeah, there's a bunch of questions around that. Um, interesting question. Are you aware of any uh, bugs or defects uh, in the current version pertinent to this particular integration? Well, so the repositories work from what we know. The repositories work work fine. Uh, we don't. I, I don't think we have any open issues against it. Uh, the plugin uh, we work on adding additional functionality, but again, as of bugs, um, I'm not aware of any open bugs that are there. If you uh, encounter something that uh, looks like a bug, by all means, please. Um, send it to a, to our support team, we will um, verify and, and fix it as soon as possible. So, you know, with software, there are probably some bugs uh, lurking out there, not that we currently aware of any major ones. Great, thanks. Um, let's see, what, uh, what disk space do you recommend for an artifactory server? So it, it it really depends on on your usage, um, and it goes from all the way uh, all the way from a Raspberry Pi, uh, which is one extreme, or just your commodity server, which is a normal usage, to a huge servers like uh, Exalogix and Exadata on on the you know really insane um, side of of things. So it really depends. On the on your on your on your usage and the disk space actually correlates to the number of artifacts you store in your artifactory server. We do a binary deduplication, so if you deploy the same file multiple times, at times it will be saved only once, so you can gain some space there. But as a rule of thumb, whatever you put in artifactory, this is how much space it will take. Julian? Oh, I'm sorry, I wasn't, I was muted. <laughs> um, as we can maintain privileged access management in Chef Server, is there the same way to do that in Artifactory um, so that you can prevent, let's say, developers from being granted access to cookbooks which are not owned by them? Uh, yeah, so absolutely, I think I, uh, um I already mentioned we have all the permission model implemented in Artifactory on the repository level and on any deeps of uh, sub-repositories, so you can uh, cut and slice uh, the, the repository access in a way that makes sense to you. We support users and groups, both created internally in Artifactory user management and also externally in LDAP or Active Directory or OAuth, and then you can add those uh, developers to different groups and provide them with uh, read access uh, or deploy access, um, adding metadata as a separate permission, and of course stuff like delete and override that you, as I mentioned, you shouldn't um, allow much 
but um, of course it's a permission by its own. And there are different uh, management level permissions. You can be an admin of, of course, all Artifactory server or just a subset of repositories or a place inside the repository itself. Um, so uh, you can specify it uh, in 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 the way that um, that you feel right. And I see here um, a follow-up question about the permissions at the repository level and not a cookbook level. Well, that's of course configurable. The permission target can be starting from a repository, or I would say a group of repositories, all the way to a, a certain file inside Artifactory. So you can go deep inside a repository and add permissions on the cookbook level as well. Great. I think that's all the questions that we have received, or there's a, a number of other questions around setting it up and things like this. And this all that information is covered in the documentation um, that we will be sending as a follow-up uh, link uh, to the attendees. So um, I think I'd like to thank Baruch uh, very much for this presentation and the very compelling demo and talking about the features and our continuing partnership with uh, JFrog. So thank you. Hey, thank you very much for, for having me, uh, Julian. It was a, a great pleasure to be here with you today. Thanks. And back to you, Jamie. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Julian and Barack, for all the great information. Uh, as a reminder, a copy of today's slide deck and additional help materials are available in the resource list widget at the bottom of your screen. And we encourage you to download any resources or bookmark any links that you may find useful. Um, and thank you to our audience for your live participation today. We, of course, hope you found value in the information that was presented. And if you like what you saw, we encourage you to share the recorded presentation with your teammates or professional networks. The on-demand version should be available by tomorrow. Thanks again for your time and have a wonderful day.